Hi, everybody. My name is John Janchig, and this is my colleague, Nick Chase. We work for Morantis, though I, I must uh, say in advance that uh, Morantis is, uh, uh, is not probably aware of what we're talking about today. <laughs> this is, you've, you've heard of, you've heard of uh, companies that give their employees a 20% project you know, uh, allowance, and, and Morantis, of course, does that after you've worked 120%. <laughs> So it's, it's the delta between 120 and 140 percent that you uh, get to spend doing uh, fun projects like this. What we're talking about today, and that's who we are, but you know, maybe I should skip on you know, so that, uh, so that uh, you don't remember us too well. <laughs> what we're talking about today is virtual reality, which is very much in the news. Um, virtual reality uh, is very much in the news primarily because of the purchase of Oculus um, the VR headset company uh, of uh, long duration and much expected delivery dates um, by uh, Facebook for a very large amount of money. Um, and um, and uh, we think that that was an extraordinarily prescient and sharp move, although it got a lot of giggles from the community and continues to get some, as well as some um, hard to understand, I guess, without a great deal of contextualizing, um, size of disappointment from former fans of Oculus who believe that they have been co-opted by a corporate giant or I don't know what they believe. But I think that putting the muscle of Facebook and particularly the cloud muscle of Facebook, them being pioneers in hardware and, uh, and cloud software, um, behind a product like Oculus is finally going to get us to where, uh, uh, to a place that I have personally hoped for a decade or more we would reach, which is Finally, VR is going to happen. It's going to happen in a big, commercially visible way. And, um, and uh, um, hopefully, it's going to have a disruptive, uh, a pleasantly disruptive, I think, effect on um, a lot of industries, obviously gaming and entertainment, but also on industries like our own uh, cloud operations. Um, nevertheless, the giggle factors associated with virtual reality persist. And it's healthy to giggle. I found this uh, picture last night, and I threw it in for no other reason than it's Vladimir Putin on a horse with VR Oculus guy on the back. Um, but it points up a very interesting uh, fact, which is that, uh, that previously, we've been in a kind of a preliminary era of VR, where VR was a very niche thing, despite the success of platforms like Second Life in the early to mid O's. Um, or at least their success in getting on the cover of Business Week. Um, <laughs> but it has not been a, a, a mass phenomenon, and VR like CD-ROMs for 20 years, right? Every, yeah. every year for 20 years was the year of the CD-ROM until finally everybody had a CD-ROM, and you know, I, I missed the year of the CD-ROM because I had four of them already, right? <laughs> and I was um, building one. Yeah. I, I, th I think that it's going to be the same uh, kind of thing with VR, it's, it's, uh, or, or, um, or, or even more recently, uh, the emergence of, um, of, um, uh, of really good broadband in, uh, in uh, urban markets uh, in America, which happened in the late 90s. And all of a sudden, the experience of a sector of the population, and not a small one, certainly not the majority yet, but the experience of a sector of the population changed dramatically. Suddenly, they were looking at the internet the way Wired magazine was describing the internet. And it was like what William Gibson talks about, where you know the future is uh, already here. It's not uh, just not evenly distributed. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Um, our topic, of course, is much smaller than um, the uh, you know the fate of the universe. Um, we're interested in uh, where DevOps, uh, where data center operations are going, and how DevOps can be augmented and uh, and facilitated by use of these technologies. Um, this, of course, is a famous picture from the movie Minority Report, uh, where uh, uh, Tom Cruise, as a future detective, um, operated a, uh, 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 what I guess would be characterized as an augmented reality system, um, a see-through heads-up display affected apparently on a transparent surface. And uh, he was able to perform very rapidly impressive computery manipulations. Um, it is our hope to, to eventually be able to facilitate similar awesomeness. Um, of course, VR is potentially a huge business opportunity for the cloud industry itself, though. It, and it would be uh, smart before we skip to the really trivial stuff, which you know, is most of it. <laughs> um, 
to talk about some of these huge opportunities. Um, there really clouded. was an actual reason we wanted to do this. Yeah, I mean, it just, you know, yeah there's yeah, we'll lots of giggles. And we got to we're play to in to virtual reality and say, we're working, That's honest. Right. But yeah. Exactly. Um, but uh, virtual reality is potentially the biggest ever medium for engagement and interaction, by which I mean way more than just entertainment, although it will be huge in entertainment as well. Um, it fuses all of the things that drive data center cloud enormousness, um, um, uh, uh, including uh, you know, its tendency to pick up um, uh, by virtue of uh, uh, visualization and, uh, and uh, you know, sort of user interface emergence. Um, the outputs of Internet of Things things, which will be, of course, incredibly numerous. Um, potentially, it could be relevant to a lot, maybe most, uh, of the things that people do for a living. Certainly, people who spend a lot of their time today in front of uh, screens will have the uh, option, uh, you know, we think, uh, of advancing to more immersive ways of working uh, in the future. And there are a lot, of, um, a lot of benefits there and a lot of opportunity for the people, everyone who makes everything from plugs to chips to racks to, to blades to, to um, uh, really everything we do, and certainly software. Um, because virtual reality is a very, very hard thing to do. In many ways, it's, it's harder than gaming, because in gaming, you can use time-honored techniques like sharding to achieve uh, high levels of simultaneity for small groups of users who have a satisfactory social experience within the game. But you don't have to build an architecture that that, um, that, that really acknowledges, for example, the idea that 50,000 people might want to attend a football game all at the same time and potentially interact with each other all at the same time. That level of concurrency um, is, uh, is uh, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a it's a moonshot kind of challenge. Um, when you consider the populations that could conceivably in be, in be involved in um, uh, entertainment-based simultaneous experience, uh, even something as, uh, you know, like, like major sporting events. Uh, the numbers are very, very big. And of course, the bar is also set high for quality of experience. Yeah, and think um, about how many people just watch the Super Bowl on TV. Exactly. And they're having a, yeah, they're I mean, having a separate experience. People, they're yeah. having a, a sort of a microscopically social experience, maybe with their friends in the living room. Yeah. But it's not the same as being at the stadium. No. Um, there's an aleatory quality to well-produced immersive virtual events, which we know because <laughs> we, know. we used to produce them. That's right. Back in the day, where, um, where, um, and we're not talking about the kind of events that, um, that uh, virtual events that um, uh, show up on the web that are really sort of um, um, a, a cute UI wrapped around a webinar. No, no, no. This is, I mean, this was an immersive experience where people would go in and that kind of propinquity. See, I can use big words too. Yeah. You uh, <laughs> anyway, but that kind of experience where people, where you would see other people's avatars you know, these physical, with non-physical representations of their physical forms, and your brain really does start to think that, you know, you are interacting with these people. John and I knew each other for years before we ever met. Actually, yeah, six or seven years. Six or seven years, and we were stand, yeah. we, we made arrangements to meet, and we were standing in the place next to each other, wondering when we were going to arrive. And finally, I don't remember which one of us called the other one. <laughs> it was you. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's you. And, yeah. and, and we were doing this for, for interesting companies. I oh, mean, yeah. It was the, you know, the Intels and the, and the Cisco's and the sons of the world. Right? Yeah. Um, the mid O's were an interesting time for virtual reality in business. Um, those times have passed, but we hope that they will return. Um, Meanwhile, however, we think that there's a lot that we can do at the data center uh, uh, level. Um, uh, we all, of course, want to be, what did Keanu Reeves play? What is Neo. this play? Neo? Neo, yeah. Um, we all want to uh, take care of our special snuffs like uh, uh, servers with a wave of our hands. Um, honestly, we think that, all kidding aside, that there is a great deal uh, that uh, virtual reality technologies and augmented reality technologies can do for operations. Um, because they use human physiology more efficiently than screens do for mind work. I mean, it really is as simple as that. If you can engage movement, if you can engage a larger group of muscles uh, in performing an action, 
if you can engage real as opposed to mapped topology. I mean, everybody deals with topology on screens, right? Um, I mean, every, everyone in this room has um, you know, a favorite layout of their windows when they're developing or whatever they have, and they know how to click from one to the other, and whether they use the mouse or the keyboard to do it, they know where everything is. But there are always those, mo those moments in those environments, those limited environments, tiny screen environments, even if you are spread out across several displays, where um, you he lose has it. Four monitors. You 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 lose it. I, I'm a you know yeah I'm a I'm a, a, a sorry case, but I just you know I like <laughs> to spread out, as my wife would say. <laughs> um, it's also easy to shift focus and viewpoint in immersive environments. You turn your head with an Oculus display on, and you see what's there. Um, with essentially no lag at this point. The demos that, uh, that, uh, uh, that we've experienced uh, and, uh, and uh, some direct R&D experience with uh, prototype devices have really convinced us that this really could be it. And Oculus, of course, is not the only contender for no, this. No, not at all. There are several devices coming out with approximately equal quality of experience, as far as I can tell. Um, the you know, devil will, I suppose, be in the details and the price points. Um, you can um, uh, you can use um, um, uh, you can provide differentiated views of data at essentially zero overhead in these environments. I'll show you, in fact, during our crude <laughs> demo section. Yes. Um, because Don't neither judge us. neither of us are artists. Um, that uh, uh, you know that you can create. Uh, I mean, if you want six screens, if you want eight screens, if you want a wall of monitors for a particular task, you can manifest them magically, of course, because you have superpowers in these environments. Whatever somebody is willing to code for you, you can do. Um, and you can manipulate you know, a room for a wall, you know, a wall full of screens, or fly in the air and look down on an array of screens. If that's the way you want to visualize multiple data sources, it can be made to work. And of course, that's you know, looking at screens in virtual environments sounds counterintuitive, but actually, it's, a, you know, it's, it's really pretty effective. <laughs> um, then there are an infinity of additional user interface paradigms that are, you know, that are left to explore um, and that we've been thinking about and I don't think have yet very successfully plumbed. No, and I don't think so. And I think that's part of why, uh, I think that's part of why the early, the first burst of big companies going into virtual reality environments didn't take off more than it did. I think we just didn't know what to do with them yet. We, the, the technology, it wasn't so much that the technology wasn't there because we were doing some amazing things with technology, but nobody knew what to do with it yet. So, so Nick and I were kicking around ideas for you know, how to use our 120 to 140% time. <laughs> and we saw a lot of you know, news items coming out about uh, Oculus earlier this year, and we said, you know, this is you know, an opportunity. Virtual reality may be coming back. It's, you know, it's interesting. Um, I haven't developed in that field in years. Um, I hadn't either. Let's, uh, you know, let's learn some new things. Let's learn uh, new things about the OpenStack SDK that we, that we uh, didn't know. Um, can we use APIs to connect OpenStack to immersive 3D platforms, tool chips, and environments? Ultimately, that was the challenge that we thought of setting ourselves. And we set the bar a little higher by saying, well, we have to do this in an OpenStacky way. We have to do this, if possible, with free, uh, uh, you know, at least free, if not free and open source um, right. software components. We have to use the native languages of OpenStack. Um, uh, obviously, OpenStack comprises many languages at this point, um, but historically, Python and web tools are probably at the center of the effort. Um, can we do it in a very open way that lets us unplug and replug components and run multiple components in parallel simultaneously through a single controller, as right. it were? And can we do it in a way that's anywhere near harmonious with community architecture standards, which I personally don't know very much about because I'm not a code committer. Right. Um, yes. I'm not a code committer either. I'm a doc committer, but I'm not a code committer. But I am aware of these things. And of course, we want to be very open about this. So when we decided, so we, yes, challenge accepted. So we accepted our own challenge, which is great, because then you can move the goal line anywhere you want. So uh, go, go right ahead. And, and then we had a moment of sober <laughs> fear where we considered the real, you know, the, the real impact of what, uh, you know, a, a significant 
not project, but exploration into unknown technology. Actually, let me tell you exactly how it went. It went like this. John, our talk got accepted. Oh my God! Now we have to build this thing! So we have some relevant experience. We know how to code a little bit. But uh, you know, my Python is very weak. Um, and OpenStack uh, Python SDK internals, I knew nothing about until a very, very short time ago. And now I know a lot more. It knows um, them very well now. It hasn't, done, um, it hasn't done my nervous system a great deal of good, but it's a, you know, it is a beautiful artifact. Um, we, uh, you know, we, we've, we've both built clusters. We build clusters oh, yeah. all the time, but we do it with Mirantis Fuel, which means, you know, it really is pretty much of a wizardy button pushing exercise. We don't, you know, download um, community and, you know, assemble it with, with uh, Bash scripts. We do not, as a rule. So, um, what we're talking about then, or what we sp started talking to each other about, was, a, you know, an abstract architecture where uh, a lot of complicated things happen between um, data inputs in the cloud, uh, including a data center, for example, and uh, a human user. Um, it is a stacky sort of thing, virtual reality. Um, a bunch of uh, messages come in, media streams may come in and need to go to places for display through relatively complex software that allows the, the visualization in three dimensions, for example, of a television signal. Um, uh, people will come in, of course, and talk to you. These environments are, you know, can be open and social. Um, and so the architecture of the outer uh, uh, layer of, of the kinds of environments that we're talking about is, um, is um, um, uh, not exactly state-based, but certainly, you know, somewhere, somewhere between state-based and interrupt-driven. Yeah, the, this is a real flux. The, the <laughs> development process for working with virtual environments is not unlike the development process involved in gaming, uh, game creation, where a, a, a relatively great amount of effort goes into creating assets and planning environments and slowly building up the bases for environments out of multiple components um, and, and then assembling these things, you know, putting them into the system. And then and dropping the physics engine on them and seeing what happens. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and then letting the system manage them, including managing their interactions with people, you know, and users. Um, people who are who are um, uh, you know, accustomed to the interrupt-driven way, the sort of event-driven way that web pages work, tend to be pretty comfortable with this. But people who are sort of more procedural in their orientation may be a little shocked. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, uh, these environments are very nonlinear. The way reality is, something will always come out of left field. And so software planning can be, a, can be an interesting, um, uh, you, you learn about race conditions in a new way <laughs> if you're working with complex social <laughs> Uh, you know, coding complex social uh, uh, experiences. Um, and then you go down through um, uh, various mappings uh, to the point where you get to models. Um, and uh, uh, a remote control plane, which is uh, processed by visualization logic and is ultimately rendered, whether the render happens on the server side or the client side, depends on the architecture of the system that you're using. Um, and then it's exposed to a, a, a local control plane and displayed logic. So for example, on the Oculus device, there's a constant render happening of the entire scene. And all the Oculus device is doing, and it's a great deal, right, is, um, is, um, uh, is um, detecting your head movement. Well, it's detecting with via accelerometers and other you know, mechanisms your head movement in, a, in an extremely consistent way, which of course is, is essential to preventing uh, uh, visual artifacting and other problems. And then it's effectively turning your view in a virtual sense onto a portion of the available render. Um, and it's uh, extremely clever. I and mean, it's a great deal of data that's you know, that's, that's being uh, transmitted. And of course, that's why the machine requirements for driving Rift headsets are, are so heavy. high, yeah. Um, so we looked at this, and we thought about this for a while, and we decided to build a thing. We realized that- Because we like building things. Yeah. So we thought we would build a thing that basically lived on, a, on a, an OpenStack cluster uh, and managed cluster resources. Um, we decided that we would build a 3D controller um, which would be as simple as possible because we didn't have the skill or the time to make it complicated. <laughs> um, and would Plus, be basically let, a... Let me, just, let me just preface this. This is a proof of concept. 
Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do not think that you're going to walk out of here with the complete virtual environment in which you are going to perform you know, remote brain surgery, because it's not going to happen yeah. today. This is not today. Right. Um, it's a, an all Python system. We, we even used a, a, a Python-based uh, web server uh, setup. Um, and uh, we use the OpenStack uh, SDK to, to, to talk to the APIs. Um, we have a 3D abstraction layer which, whose job is um, to work with the persistence layer to basically take information from the cloud and send information to the cloud while minimizing um, uh, minimizing duplicate, uh, you know, transmission and, and now let me, uh, let me I want to talk about that for, for just a minute. This, this part right here, well, you can't see me pointing at it, but this part right here, the 3D controller, uh, to me, oops, to me, that is one of the most important pieces of this. And the reason that I say that is because that is essentially uh, a piece of middleware that sits between OpenStack and whatever environment it is that you are trying to display to. It doesn't matter what environment it is. It may not even be a 3D environment. It may be, you know, some other kind of representation, you know, that, that we just haven't even thought of yet. Um, but the point is that we're, we're pulling it out uh, and, um, you know, my first thought was, well, why don't we just hit whatever the cache server that Horizon uses is? Uh, so I talked to somebody I know who works on Horizon, and they said, we don't have one. And I said, that's going to be interesting when we have, you know, the Internet of Things and we have, you know, hundreds or thousands or millions of devices all hitting the cloud at the same time. Um, so... Uh, so I wanted to make sure that we kind of built this sort of middleware piece that acts as an intermediary between these environments and the stack itself. So, so he did. You know, <laughs> proof of concept. <laughs> Uh, the other part that runs on the cloud, uh, although it could run conceivably anywhere, and I've been running it on my laptop, you know, I'll be running it on my laptop for this demo, um, is uh, an environment server, which is a component of client server based um, uh, uh, VR systems. Um, so we have uh, actually two different kinds of VR systems to Correct. demonstrate to you today. We have a client server based system, which is intrinsic, intrinsically social, although we won't be using it in a social way. We could. Um, and we have a, a, an entirely client-based uh, experience. Which will uh, be running on my laptop. Which runs locally. Um, in any case, there's plenty of space on the cloud for a M1 medium server to run an environment, uh, which is all you need for, you know, for small applications. It's quite performant. Uh, and then there is a client that sits in front of the user and, and uh, you know, enables uh, their interactions with, uh, with the, the virtuality. Right. So, it turned out that there were quite a lot of good products that we could choose from and still stay within our free or free and open source. Right, dicta. exactly. Yeah, so, uh, so that once we decided, oh, we'd like to hit Oculus, the first thing was, great, how do we do that? Turned out that that was not as difficult as uh, we thought it was going to be. Uh, there is an application called Unity. Um, I would bet that even though most of you don't know it, I would say virtually everyone in this room has probably interacted with an application that's been built on Unity. And that is because it is used to create uh, 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 mobile apps. Uh, but it creates mobile apps, it creates uh, 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 Windows apps, Mac apps, Android apps, PlayStation apps, uh, and Oculus apps. So uh, that, that is beautiful. Um, it, it, can be, it can be a standalone app, or you can actually create a multiplayer networked environment in it, which is terrific if you're trying to create those kind of social uh, environments. Um, it does not allow us to use Python, but it does give you a choice of C Sharp or JavaScript. So most of what we did, we did in JavaScript, because it's you know open and all that. Um, it works beautifully, even though uh, the JavaScript itself is 
inexplicably limited in places where you wouldn't think that it would be, like there's no split function. Why? You should have seen Nick I don't know. Discovered that there was no split function. I, I, I'm sorry. How do you have a programming language without a split function? I, I don't get it. Anyway, um, but there is a huge community of users. They contribute all kinds of um, uh, apps and subroutines and modules that you can buy. I, well, you know, we'll, we'll see one of them today. Uh, just a little one floating text and stuff. Um, but it, it runs, it takes care of the virtual reality piece uh, with you really not having to do anything. It takes care of, you know, the head tracking and everything and um, you just have to compile for it and, and go. So, uh, so that's, going, that's one of the demos you're going to see today. So then the other system that we decided to, to work with because it is legitimately uh, um, fully open source uh, and is maintained by a large and enthusiastic community to this day is uh, called OpenSim, which is a, um, uh, it was originally a C-sharp and is now a mono multi-platform um, um, uh, reverse engineered version of the what was originally the Second Life server. Um, it's a, um, uh, it can run in, uh, uh, quite efficiently on a laptop. It can run on, uh, runs beautifully on OpenStack on Ubuntu. Um, and we've had it up on all sorts of different platforms. Um, if you wrap it in a firewall, it presents, uh, uh, you know, zero oddball security risks to uh, organizations that decide to use it in controlled circumstances. Um, and we like it a lot. I mean, it does, it does everything that Second Life was famous for. Um, which is, which is, um, um, including, by the way, making it really easy to build an app like this. Well, which is <laughs> simplicity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's a benefit to simplicity, and it, there's a benefit to having development tool chain built into the product. Yes, which, very much so. Which this architecture has. Uh, it doesn't scale well, but no, you know that was always the failing of this architecture, and it's it doesn't scale well because what they're doing is extremely difficult. They have a um, they have an entirely buildable system. Anytime a person wants, they can essentially start building a thing that becomes part of the environment and will persist for everyone. And so with that limitation, you're, you're very far out of the World of Warcraft scale yes. you know, game. Um, and there is a, a huge community of people, particularly in university education, who are using uh, and uh, extending the product, including my friend, Dr. Krista Lopez, um, who, uh, uh, I'm shouting out here because I, I guess because she's exemplary of the kind of people who work on on, uh, on OpenSim. Um, she's a, a longtime professor uh, at, at Xerox Park, interested in uh, everything from uh, from urban planning to um, to use of computers to uh, to improve the the lot of uh, people in in uh, in uh, poor and war torn regions. Um, she's the author of Elements of Programming Style, which is uh, for sale on Amazon and is a really superb book for people who are trying to polish up their skills in, you know, any given uh, idiom. This is John's way of saying, "Don't laugh because we said the word Second Life." There are cool <laughs> people working there. Well, you're right, and she won the Pizzagatti <laughs> Award from the Ties Foundation. So. Um, Without any further ado, and before we run out of time, yes. we're going to roll into the cute demos. So this is the moment when I try to remember whether <laughs> anything is still. OK, good. Well, I, I appear to have a screen. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're OK, screen. so I'm going to roll us in, and I'm going to create a bunch of VMs. I'm going to create a. Uh, so we're going to start with John's OpenSim demo. All right. All right, so, so talk, here we talk are us in, through this. In extremely simple, surrounded by water world. Um, this uh, this demo has gone through many um, um, uh, many changes, but I think end to end, it probably took me two and a half hours to build. Um, it um, it uh, expresses only part of the APIs that we've written, and and does as a result only very simple things. But it uses um, uh, intrinsic features of the system, including the ability to um, to create multiple media streams, um, to to uh, to do that thing that I was talking about earlier, where you can visualize multiple uh, tabs, for example, of a of a um, um, uh, of a display. So there is my horizon. Wait, before before you do anything else, before you do anything else, John, 
Raise your hand if you read the description of this session and thought this was going to be marketing BS and we didn't actually build anything. Okay, now, at least 50% of you are lying. Because <laughs> everybody I talked to this week said, oh, you're doing that OpenStack in 3D thing? Yeah, I didn't think you were actually building anything. I thought that was just marketing BS. All right, so to show you whether or not it's marketing BS. Um, okay. So uh, I guess uh, I will push the big blue button, or actually I will pull, I, I will push the well, big. Well, explain what you got going here. All right. Well, what I have going here is, is what I was talking about before. This is essentially three tabs, uh, you know, and of course everybody experiences multiple tabs on their desktops or multiple screens. Um, but what these are is uh, differentiated clones of one another. I created one tab. I then shift dragged to copy it three times, and I could go on all afternoon making copies of it and set each one of the different web pages, and, and I would have a world of web pages surrounding me. I won't you know, do that, uh, particularly since the platform can be a little shaky when it's running a laptop, but, um, but uh, you know, certainly you see the idea. And these web pages are as interactable as, you know, as any web pages, just slightly slower, I would say, than Chrome or uh, you know, a, a good modern browser. Um, so. Without so further ado. Can we, yeah, so what are we doing? Well, what we're doing, I guess, first off is, is looking at another feature of these things, which is the ability to create complex, dense, and informative 3D models. Um, these are, um, uh, these are uh, uh, Dell servers that, uh, that I found on a, a, a public site uh, called TurboSquid that someone, uh, uh, someone expended a great deal of loving care building a very accurate model of uh, a, a very nice piece of Dell hardware that happens to be the uh, ARF uh, uh, 620 on which uh, um, we recently did a, a reference architecture with Dell. Um, so this is actually recommended virtual hardware <laughs> <laughs> and has passed HCL validation. Um, and what I've done is I've- How uh, often does that happen? I've preloaded it with, uh, with, a, um, uh, with a command that to be fair could also be entered in, in uh, OpenStack CLI as a single Nova boot command. Uh, it would be a very, very long, uncomfortable Nova Boot command to enter, but you could do it. And what it will do, if I'm uh, lucky and my fingers are crossed, is, um, is uh, launch uh, a, set of, um, uh, a set of servers and propagate a Docker engine onto them, creating a swarm cluster. Oh, you actually did it? Yes. <laughs> He's a brave guy. So, so it says that these VMs are now available, so I need to find a visualization that will show that they are. Perhaps if I refresh one of these pages, it will be kind enough to show me my brand new servers. Or not. Well, you <laughs> see, that everybody who uses Horizon is familiar with this, right? <laughs> That's how you know it's live. Yeah. Uh, See if I can even remember that password. Apparently I did. And there they are, UCP one through three. Yay! You know what, while we're, <laughs> while we're doing this, while we're doing this, John, give, give us a name for another server. Give us a name. Bob. Bob? Okay, Bob. Would you launch an instance called Bob, please? Okay, you want me to do this yeah, through just Horizon, through Horizon. Right? That's okay. okay. I will launch an instance called Bob. Watch the Bob. Bob Morantis. <laughs> no, no, then we would be calling it Alexi or, you know, Roman or. Okay. Uh, you know. There's Bob. We're gonna Boris. Put Bob on a medium and we're going to boot blah, 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 blah. Everything looks good. What's that? We're going to no, put no. a 3D key on it. Default, default. No, no, this, this is why this is why I asked you guys for a name, so you know that this is legit. This is not, you know, we didn't do this ahead of time or anything like that. That's <laughs> planting the audience. They're planting the audience from Susa, right? I would hope a planted audience would have a better name than Bob. That's it. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Lamar, at least. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Bob is uh, all right. So Bob there's Bob. Bob has no state. 
Bob has no state. Yeah, Bob has no state. Oh. And I'll tell you why Bob has no state. It's because we've run out of resources. Oh, we've run out of resources. You know what? You could probably That's, kill, uh, I, I'm kill just two gonna... of the other ones, too. Really? Okay. Yeah. Kill two of the other Oh, okay, we should represent them we, as cattle. We thought about that, the, the, the skeuomorphic or comic skeuomorphism. Yeah. Yes, comic skeuomorphism. And, and John, you want to take the analogy that we were discussing yesterday at breakfast? I told you you could have it. Not cattle, but. You're challenging me. It's still too early. It's too early in the morning. We were saying that, um, we were saying that uh, you know, we talk about OpenStack servers being like cattle, actually sometimes they're more like goldfish. Um, you know, and if you're really lucky, you don't like come home and, you know, find them flopping under the TV, you know, all dusty and everything. Okay, so, uh, so, no, not with Mosse. Do, do we have Bob? Uh, we don't have Bob yet. Okay, go ahead and bring up Bob. Virtual screens to refresh. Okay. Things are being funky. My laptop is unhappy. You don't want me to dance, dude. That would be bad. That would be ugly. What's that? That would work too. That would work too? <laughs> no, no, you don't want that. Trust you're not, me, you're not you gonna don't log want into that. Bob, are you? I'm not going to log into Bob, don't worry. I don't know Bob that well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching too much Flip Wilson, man. <laughs> All right, so we good? No, we still have no state, which is not good. Bob broke the demo. Yeah. <laughs> Bob broke, you know what? Bob broke Hold the on, demo. you know what? Hold on, mm -hmm. hold on. Keep, keep it there, All right. keep it there. We'll go in the other way. Um, can I have my screen? Thank you. Okay, so this is, um, so this is Unity. Um, well, this is, this is the Unity interface anyway. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, start up an application that was clearly art directed by an engineer, uh, i.e. me, um, because as you can see, uh, the, the lovely grass texture, which is about the only um, artistic thing here, and I didn't do that myself, and of course we have um, boxes, and I'm not connected to the VPN. Oh, no, there we are. Okay, so um, as you can see, we have kind of like a first person view here. Um, we have a number of different VMs that are, that are here. Did we get Bob or not? Uh, Bob is alive now. Bob is alive. There's Bob! <laughs> you see him? You see Bob? So these are real, these are the real servers that are there, um, that are there. So what, what we've got is we've actually got um, servers and images. Um, these are the images that we have here. And, you know, here's the thing. This, uh, John said to me, you know, uh, we have to stop believing that things are going to be easy. Uh, because we really were kind of going nuts trying to finish this. And, and, but really, when you come right down to it, this is, we did this in a couple of days. It's just the wrong couple of days that we picked to do it in. Um, so, um, yeah, so this is, so you see we've got Bob there, we've got some servers there, we've got some images here. Um, so if I want to create another server, so first of all, I mean, I can, I can run around. This is actually, um, <laughs> this is actually the first person shooter engine, um, which made it really easy for me. I didn't have to worry about, you know, dealing with the camera or anything. Um, and um, I can go ahead and I can, special feature. I will get there. <laughs> don't, don't. Don't, don't telegraph the punchline, man. So like I can drag stuff around. Um, I can pick up, so like, let's say I wanted to start a new VM. Okay, I've got a blank new VM standing there. So I can pick up an image and I can drag it over. I mean, obviously this is not the most convenient interface, but you know, we're just kind of fooling around and I can drag it over to the new VM. Come on. We can do it. We can do it. Come on, baby. There we go. <laughs> All right. I'm terrible. I'm terrible at shooters. I, I really, really am. Um, so, um, 
Now that was uh, so. I think I think it is, go ahead, and we should see it come up now under instances on his side. Wait, don't don't refresh yet. Put give us his for a minute. Okay, so that's what we had before. Four servers. Go ahead and grab it again. Refresh. Refresh it. Yes. And, and there we go. And there's our there's our new server created from our 3D environment. Um, Thank you. We, we also have the option to delete servers. Um, should I? Just create them. That's not all we did. No. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to, you know, because we called it Bob, I'm not going to get rid of Bob. Yeah. I, I, I was going to get. I'm still I, sad that they got rid of Microsoft Bob. I, <laughs> I was going to get rid of Bob, but because of the way that we delete these servers, I just don't feel right getting yeah. rid of Bob because this is how we're going to get rid of the server. Yeah. Delete another one now. Yeah, I'm going to delete another one. As you can see. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, give us uh, give us my screen. I'm sorry. Wait, wait. Yeah. Give us my screen back. Thank you for the reminder. See, I'm seeing it. <laughs> I don't know why you're not seeing it. Um, yeah. So uh, so you'll see one of them is gone already because I already got rid of it. But uh, as you can see, uh, we have a special method. <laughs> All right, raise your hand if you want me to kill Bob. Oh, All right. <laughs> All right, Bob. That's it. You've had it. You have, you have outlived your usefulness. There you go. And take us back to, take us back to him. Refresh. Oh, no, Horizon. Take us uh, go to Horizon so we can see whether Bob oh, is gone. Oh, to Horizon. Or... Sorry, 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 no, sorry. Okay. We can no, just sorry. make sure that Bob is gone. Wrong Horizon. Well, it doesn't Bob matter. Is, Bob is still there in that Horizon. Uh, refresh this Horizon, and Bob will, of course, be gone. There you go. So not marketing BS. We did really build it. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll go back to our. Stay with me and stay with we'll him. Wrap this up. Don't worry, folks. Yes, we, we'll we get you to your break really more, quick. More slides. Yes. So, onward to the matrix from this point. We'll be putting select pieces of this code uh, on GitHub once we refactor it to the point where we're no longer laughing and face palming. <laughs> um, and uh, we'll keep it up there as long as nobody snarks. Yes. Um, otherwise, we'll deny everything. Um, <laughs> I'll be working with, uh, with uh, um, uh, trying to get close to the OpenStack SDK project and solve their little documentation problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a little documentation problem. And we'll keep working on this, particularly this abstraction layer that uh, we talked about in the environment driver framework that, uh, that uh, will let us uh, eventually plug into the VR environment systems right. of the future. And, and if anybody wants to help out on this, you know, uh, it's really a lot of fun. Honestly, I had so much fun learning Unity. I, before we started this, no idea. Okay, really, I had never used it before. I didn't know it existed. It's not that hard to use. Um, and OpenSim, OpenSim is my first love, which he didn't want to use. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I have to torture him over this. It has a reputation. It has a reputation. Okay, anyway, so. so that's Go ahead. pretty much it. Are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah, that's what we want to know. Uh. When we start, when we proposed this months ago, we had an Oculus on order. We had an Oculus on order, and we expected to have it by now, but of course we do not. And by so. the time I discovered that it was not going to arrive in time, I made a futile effort to acquire an HTC Vive he as did. well, which Unity which Cross compiles it would, to. Yes. But um, and that didn't work out either. So we're very sorry, uh, yes. and we promise. We but promise the code to, would to work to the next uh, to the next summit. The code would work. Oh yeah, so, that would absolutely yes. work. It would yeah. absolutely work. Unity does a great job of Oculus support. Yes. Yes, sir. So uh, I'm probably the only Unity developer in the entire crowd. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, then you don't get to experience. see that code <laughs> until we refactor it. No, I want that code. That, that's what I was going to ask. Are you guys going to make a package available on the asset store? Uh, I, I'll tell you what. 
we will if you'll agree to get with me to make sure nobody laughs at it. Yes, absolutely. Seriously. Absolutely. And I have an Oculus, by the way. Whew. Oh, great. All right. Awesome. That is awesome. We should have so socialized this. Then you yeah, I know. Then we could have got him. And the, you know, the, we could have a much cooler demo. And he hasn't laughed at us and left the room, so we must be OK. It's because we're so self-deprecating. There you go. We laughed first. Uh, any, yeah, OK, you can cut another question. I don't think the mic is on. We'll anyway, repeat the question. Um, yeah. You said that you would make the code available on GitHub, but where on GitHub? Uh, we will make the code available on GitHub, and um, we will publicize the location uh, in a at, blog, in a blog yeah. or uh, at Morantis.com or uh, at Morantis IT on Twitter or uh, in the OpenStack Unlocked newsletter which you can get to by subscribe.openstacknow.com. Don't ask me about the URLs. It's a long story. Any other questions? Go in once. Go in twice. Sold. You're free for your break. Thank you all so much for coming. We really appreciate Thanks it. A lot.